Um, I'm just a stone man. I follow stones all my life. I guided by stones. I listen to stones. Um, I grew up near the Lake District, which is a wonderful playground of stones and megalithic sites. And I became obsessed with them in some ways. And um, they began to speak to me after a while. And so I began to understand something about the matrix of the Earth and something about the way some megalithic peoples uh, used to um, think and behave. And it's far different to what the textbooks say about it. So um, over the past five years, my partner Caroline and I have been exploring Italy and Greece. And we found, uh, to our amazement, that some of the so-called Etruscan, Roman, um, uh, near, uh, sorry, Iron Age sites were, um, had these incredible megalithic walls around them that uh, were colossal in size, and the stones were arranged in a way that seemed far superior to the abilities of the Romans and the Etruscans. So I'm going to um, show you some of these magnificent walled um, cities and towns and um, talk about who may have built them. The Etruscans are one of the most mysterious races in the world. They appeared around 1000 BC and disappeared around 400 BC, mainly because they were absorbed by the Romans. The Romans did a fantastic job in destroying their civilization. There was hardly anything left of their cities today. Even the foundations were taken away. All that is left is their tombs and, some, of course, their art, their pottery, and their fantastic jewelry which is, to me, equal to the uh, Celtic jewelry that came out of Northumberland. Um, the Etruscans had a 12-city state, and it was centered around one particular temple in the middle at, uh, at near Lake Bolsana. And these legendary 12 cities um, are still being searched for today. It's believed that they've found them all, but some are still not so certain. Such was the destruction of these sites. So the capital of these um, cities was Tarquini, or Tarquina. And it's, it's here that um, a mysterious event took place. And apparently, out of a furrow came a small child out of inside the earth, and he dictated the doctrine of the Etruscans, their religion, um, their, their method of farming, um, building, architecture. This little being um, relayed this to a man called Tarkin, and Tarkin then relayed it to his people. He became king. And we had then Tarquin kings, a succession of Tarquin kings from this very man, which is all very mysterious. Um, so we decided to visit Tarquina last year to see what is left of it. So most Etruscan cities are set in over two valleys. Um, one spur would be the necropolis, where the dead buried, and the acropolis, where the, the, the civic centers and the towns were. So you see that Tarquina at the top, uh, the city, and the necropolis below. And you see that the necropolis is far larger than the acropolis. In other words, the, the Etruscans um, had a great belief in life after death. In fact, they were obsessed with life after death. Their um, religious drawings, paint, and artwork is um, very highly uh, spiritual. So, unfortunately, all, to, all you can see of Tarquina today is just um, some grassy fields over on a knoll. But the um, necropolis, the cemetery is open, but there's, again, very little to see because it's all underground. It's completely destroyed. But this is how it looked around 900 BC. 
They were all these cone-shaped pyramids above the tombs. They're magnificent little pyramids in some ways. And amongst these little pyramids were also long barrow type tombs with uh, this long passage, often orientated to the equinox or the uh, setting sun at the summer solstice. And inside these magnificent painted um, tombs, walls, um, depicting different races of people. You'll see at the back, there's a blonde haired, um, white skinned woman. Um, amongst other more red-skinned, darker tan Mediterraneans. So uh, it's believed that the, um, from what we've found, the Etruscans settled with other races in Italy, um, and some of those being a Celtic Nordic sort of uh, race as well. Uh, in some of the tombs, um, there are these mystical doorways guarded by angels, two angels either side. One holds a hammer and is equated to Thor, and the other one is like Saint Michael, an angel carrying a spear. These are supposed to be the guardians to the underworld. And here he is again, the Thor-type angel, holding his hammer. Now the other city that blew us away, if you like, was the Vulci, which as you can see from the map, it's just above Tarquini. Again, this is um, built on top of um, a spur with a valley all the way around it, um, separated from the burial ground on the Acropolis. It's an absolutely spellbinding place, surrounded by waterfalls, great gorges. But again, there's very little to see. But um, just to get like, yourself familiarized with traditional um, Etruscan walls, here is a little example here. You see, these curb stones are classic Etruscan. You'll see them all Etruscan sites. And the masonry is um, set end to end and side by side in straight courses. The problem is you see a lot of the guidebooks um, show, say that um, these sites are Etruscan, but they don't have Etruscan walls, they're nothing like these. But uh, so sometimes you have to do a lot of consensus of these sites and read between the lines. Also at this site of Vulci is uh, this great mound of Cucamella. Now this is from a, no a notice board at the, um, at the reception information center showing what they believe was a large mound. Uh, in size it would be larger than Silbury Hill and bigger than Newgrange. But they can't understand why it had a, a square tower and a round tower in the middle and a labyrinth inside. Well, archaeologists and historians have come up with this theory that, do you remember those little cone pyramids you saw at the other um, site at Tarquinia? Well, here you had the biggest ever. Um, and this makes sense of the structure inside. The tower was supporting, and um, they'd found tiles from the sides of the cone in the, when they excavated it. So they know this was one of the biggest cone-shaped pyramids in Europe. And it was surrounded by lions, lion heads on top of the walls. And a, a labyrinth, an intricate labyrinth all the way through to a tomb that belonged to one of the Tarquins. But the photograph on the right shows what it looks like today. There's very little left of it. Here's an artist's impression of how it looked inside. You've seen the labyrinth, and also this strange staircase going down below the round tower. Rather like some of the Egyptian pyramids. The Etruscans were also fantastic engineers. They built the first bridges. This bridge dates from 500 BC. 
you know, it's Romans were supposed to have built bridges, weren't they, didn't they? But uh, no, the Etruscans did. And um, in fact, most of the Etruscan engineers um, really um, gave their knowledge to the Romans at the end of their empire. So the Romans actually built their empire on the backs of the Etruscans. Now, the Etruscan coffins fascinate me because I keep seeing them in my, on my own doorstep. Because in Dorset, on the Isle of Portland, 500 of these coffins were found buried deep in the earth. And what's mysterious is these coffins are not supposed to be buried. They're actually sepulchres that were supposed to be on, on the level surface, not buried. Um, but for some reason on Portland, they were buried deep, 500 of them, as if somebody was trying to cover up their tracks, probably the Romans again. But here you see one of the Portland ones. Um, to delve a little bit into this more <laughs> mystery, a bit deeper, along with these um, Etruscan, I think, Etruscan coffins on Portland, was found this mysterious head. And uh, it's made of granite and Portland's limestone, and I think for many years I've been trying to get people to see this head and see what they feel, see how they feel about it. And it was mysteriously found in a garden, very deep. Um, the owner had um, excavated it and, and stuck it in his garden as an, a kind of feature. But the um, problem with all the Portland people who are quite insular anyway and have a kind of illustrious pedigree, they all started to bow to this um, this head, and uh, it became a focus of of, <laughs> of a pilgrimage to a lot of the local peoples, and and some said it reminded them of their seafaring ancestors. Um, so he removed it to the museum, and it's been in the museum at Portland ever since. And I came across it and said, you know, what is this? And they said, oh well. There was a few stories. One said that the Portland quarry way, quarry makers decided to. Um, have a bit of fun in their spare time and make this head. Well, I said, well, it's granite. I said, what was he doing with granite in, on Portland? Oh, well, yeah, um, we didn't realize that. So, um, well, <laughs> the, there's this other story, you know, that came out of a garden, you know, so. I showed this to a lady, um, a psychic lady, not long ago, and she said it was a Philistine or a Canaanite. But I'm wondering if it is one of a depiction of the old seafaring ancestors, because you know the Etruscans were shown with Oriental eyes, you know, and, and they were a mix of Eastern and Western races. So. But what's peculiar is he's got a Mohican, and if you turn him on his side, he's got a really hooked nose, like a Semitic Jewish nose. But over to Sevateri. Um, not too far north of Rome. Uh, it's probably one of the greatest burial grounds of the so-called Etruscans, um, next to the city of the Etruscans, which has uh, disappeared now, called Care. But here you see classic Etruscan masonry again, the curved stones. And the way the masonry is um, put together is the same as the wall, these curved stones. Classic Etruscan. Old on a minute. This tomb is a bit further away and it has nothing like the Etruscans. This is carved out of solid stone from the base. That no stone has been laid upon stone here. This is carved, a sculptured tomb. And it looks almost oriental in its style. Um, this, that kind of frieze I've seen in India around tombs there. And these tombs contained incredible pictures as well, paintings that to me, it was almost as, as good as the Egyptian um, drawings and paintings. And some of these round tombs had polygonal walls, not of large stones, but even so, the skill of the mason here was, was absolutely amazing. But to me, it, it, it shows that this cemetery was, it was built for many different types of, of people who, over thousands of years, but the guidebook says that everything here is Etruscan. But my eyes tell me different. Here's some of the paintings inside some of these round tombs. 
absolutely fabulous. And you know, in all the Etruscan paintings, there's no depictions of war. There's no depictions of um, anything negative. It often shows them in their lifestyle, their dances, their movements, their cooking, their everyday life. Um, often they're lounging around and eating food. So they lived quite an opulent life because to me, Tuscany, the area of Tuscany and Lazio is probably the most fertile area in the world. Um, and I'm, I can say that with <laughs> justification because I've been there so many times and I've traveled the world a lot. And when you eat food that comes out of the Tuscany soil, it is highly charged. It's, um, if you like, paramagnetic, as Dan mentioned uh, yesterday. It's, uh, paramagnetic and diamagnetic is an important term, as I think I should mention. Uh, some stones, with the su substances that are paramagnetic um, attract a magnetic field. In other words, if you crush a piece of magne uh, paramagnetic stone in a glass of water and stick a high-powered magnet to the side, you'll see that it'll stick, um, little bits will stick to the glass. So the ancients knew, I believe the ancients knew how to use these stones um, for electrical uses as well, which we might go into later. Another of the incredible structures of the Etruscans was at Porcena, um, near the, at the city called Clusium. And here we find a fantastically brazen dome made of bronze, supported by four pyramidal towers, with a labyrinth room below, with the entrance to the labyrinth here. Uh, these structures are unexplained. Nobody knows why they entered these labyrinths and what the purpose of these structures were. I mean, they were suspended by, the bells were ringing all the time here at the top. Somebody might know. Barati um, is another of the old Etruscan towns, and here was here's one of the greatest archaeological sites in Italy, showing massive tombs similar to Newgrange in Ireland, chambered tombs. Um, here you can see how one would look in with the mound taken away. Uh, inside there are chambers like this with these compartments and corbel ceilings. And also some of these uh, mounds had stone circles around them, rather like those at Newgrange. But Barati itself is interesting because it reminded me of, of the Phoenicians, it's Barat Phoenicians, as um, Waddell once said that um, the Barats uh, came to Britain, mined the tin, and um, they also mined the lead and tin in Etruscany, uh, uh, Tuscany, or Et Etrusca. And that area, Brati, was full of mines. So it's probably a Phoenician port there. So one of the sites we went to after all those was Roselle because it was said to be an Etruscan city. Um, but as we walked through the entrance into the amphitheater, it, it was all very Roman, rubble-type stones. But just on the outskirts, sort of off the beaten track, are these fantastic megalithic walls. Now, these particular walls are not polygonal. Uh, they do not lock together in the way some of the sophisticated walls I've seen, but they are cyclopean. In other words, they're stones laid upon stones and then cut in a manner I'll show you now. You see how they've built them. They've laid stone upon stone, then cut the face. Uh, there's seven miles of these walls. That's quite a feat in itself, isn't it? And this reminded me of the walls in um, Tyrans in Greece. Uh, they're built in the same fashion. The Tyrans, according to Homo, dates from the Bronze Age and was built by Cyclops. A giant, probably because nobody could explain how man could lift such huge stones. Often finding the larger stones were in the upper courses and not at the bottom. So it was as if they were showing off that they could move these stones very easily. 
Inside Roselle, we also found that their tombs were cut into the city itself. They they channeled at a groove in in the floor, and then tunneled into each side to make tombs. But cutting, removing stone was easy for these people. But then um, we visited a, a, another city nearby, which I found from an old Victorian guide, because today these sites are not very well signposted, as some have found. And um, when, you find, when you stumble on these places, you find the most mysterious things. Now this site is called Cossa, and it's not too far from Orbitello on the coast of Tuscany. And George Dennis spoke about um, this site as being um, Roman, 3rd to 4th century BC. Um, even though the walls um, have not been seen anywhere else in the Roman Empire, they seem to you know, miraculously have built polygonal walls at this site. Um, and it, they're found nowhere else in the Roman Empire. You know, so he, he was suspicious that these walls are far older than Roman. But, of course, the archaeologists say that the Etruscans, you know, well, we know they built squared blocks, and it's too sophisticated for the Etruscans. It has to be Roman. And so there's this constant argument. And I think, as such, these sites remain half-closed. I mean, they are open. You've got to officially go there, but there's no signpost to get to them and hardly any car parking. So um, there's a bit of conspiracy about the, this ancient history in Italy. I think the Italians are more sort of uh, interested in um, the present day problems and now with their history. But then sometimes I find history is connected with the present day. So on the Acropolis at Tossa, at Cossa, there is um, a Roman uh, r a rubble, if you like. But I found a piece of wall that gave a, a clue to the age of this site. Because here we see, clearly see Roman masonry at the top. Etruscan masonry with the curb stones below. And then further on, underneath the Etruscan, there's the Etruscan part here, underneath, built on the foundations of the Etruscan site, there's this earlier polygon wall. Each stone's a different size but they fit together in a way um, that they, you can hardly get um, a knife in between the joints where it hasn't been weathered, because this particular wall has been weathered by sea and air erosion for thousands of years, probably. And the gateway is another indication. Um, We'd found that megalithic cities, they tended to have straight gateways with a big lintel going across. And this is classic of um, what we saw at Cossa. Nevertheless, we were quite excited with Cossa to find such a, an amazing site that seemed to be like a city out of time. So I decided to look into the folklore of the area and ask the locals about these cities. And they said, oh, you, uh, this, the Cossa was a, a port of the... Um, uh, Pelasgi. And I thought, well, who are the Pelasgi? Um, so I looked up in the internet and library books and everything, and I found that, according to legends, the Pelasgi were the founding fathers of ancient Greece. The, they, they were the people who settled um, alongside the Etruscans um, in 1000 BC. Um, their origin is unknown, and it is said that they were great seafarers, so I decided to visit Saturnia um, because the guidebooks say that this was the first city built by the Pelasgi in, in Italy. And what I found was these incredible Pelasgian walls um, by Porta Romana. Because, of course, the guidebooks say that all this stonework is Roman. But you can see that is Roman here. Well, this, is this is built into it. So these walls, you can feel they date from a, a far older time. 
He doesn't, you don't need to have, he doesn't need rocket science. And the, the roads as well that lead out of Saturnia um, are built of far massive stones than the ones you normally see on Roman roads. It's as if everything was bigger, and they were bigger people, maybe. But uh, these particular roads, as you see here, were actually huge, made of huge stones, unlike the, the Roman stones, which are more smaller, sort of slabs. And just outside of Saturnia is um, a megalithic cemetery that, again, feels much older than anything else I've seen. And it's said that these are the tombs of the giants who built who were the Pelasgi. So some of the things historians say about the Pelasgi were that they merged with the Etruscans. They're also known as Titans. Um, there are maritime people whom are called the Divine Pelasgi. They worship deities of Hermes and Saturn. Um, built cities in the Peloponnese, Troy, and Greek, Crete, introduced art into Greece from Italy, and they were destroyed in the Bronze Age cataclysm. All these things have been said about the Pelasgi. In that area, we decided to visit the Tufa Valley because in this area, there are supposed to be some of the most incredible religious sites of the Etruscans. And in fact, people say it is the uh, Etruscan Valley of the Kings, now, what's interesting about this site, it's full of highly paramagnetic stone. This, it's rich in iron. It attracts magnetic fields. It gives off magnetic fields. So it's special in itself. And the ancients knew where these special places were. And it's full of fault lines, very highly volcanic. And we know from our research with stone circles that m the majority of stone circles and megalithic sites in this country are built near fractures or faults. And that somehow they were used to draw up that energy. We'll go into that later, but I think the Etruscans wanted to take some, use this energy um, of the tooth of stone. We found that w some incredible tombs that were carved out of solid rock, rather like the, the uh, ruins in Petra, um, this one you're looking at looks just a, a, a bit of a mess, but this is how it looked in its day. Um, not one stone upon stone here. This is a massive carving, a massive sculpture out of solid rock. Um, some of you may have known that there is these types of tomb in India as well. In the um, is it Allura, I think. Ajanta. But uh, the magnificence of these tombs, um, to me, remind me of the Greek-style temples. So some people say maybe the, uh, these were a colony of Greeks. But their language that's all over these, these sculptures is, is completely unique. In fact, it's said that the Etruscan language is, is a remnant of the oldest European language. Um, but it was taken away by the Romans and destroyed. And it's, they're still trying to decipher it today. I mean, you read Etruscan um, from right to left. Now, we read from left to right, but you read Etruscan the other way around. And they know what the words are now they, because they relate to Greek and Phoenician languages. But they don't know what the words actually mean. <laughs> from, they've, got the, they've got a whole sentence, a whole thing, but we don't know what each word means. It's, it, a lot of it... it um, it relates to runic, the uh, Futark uh, language. And so, and, and it, it's reckoned that the runic language came out of Etruscan script. Another of the great tombs we'd seen, or this one was a, actually a false doorway, rather like the ones you see in Peru. Um, there's no entrance, the entrance is actually in a different place. But it was beautifully sculptured, again, out of solid rock. And they also um, built this incredible megalithic stone, which has five fingers carved into it, five little stubby fingers. It's called the Hand of Orlando. It's probably the, the biggest megalith in Italy. Um, 
and it's placed in the Tufa Valley, not too far from these temples. The reason why there's five little fingers, well, some people say that it, they are sighting cuts for sort of distant stars. Others say that, um, you know, it's just a sculpture um, commemorating a giant, Orlando. Um, but it may have something to do with energetics, because we doused uh, the energy currents running through this stone, where it was splitting into five bands. Now, it leads us to the, the Etruscan cuts, which is in this area of the Tufa Valleys. Um, the area is, surra is around, it, around it, uh, the area of Lowe. Pitliagano, Serrano, Savannah, all those towns are in that Tufa Valley. And it's in the south, southern Tuscany, just above Lazio, near the border of Lazio. Uh, these Etruscan cuts are amazing because, again, they've been cut out of solid rock, from the, from some of them from the top right to the bottom. Uh, and some of them are over 60 feet high. Um, the one I went into is actually three times higher than this roof. And they cut it from the top down to the ground. It didn't seem to make sense why I go to all that trouble to make a thin passage. As archaeologists think that maybe there are hiding places, places to escape. Um, but it seemed a lot of effort just for that, because also some of the burial places were at the end of these passages, and they were leading to the sort of the, the towns. So it was like a, uh, they're passages from the Acropolis to the Necropolis, or vice versa. And there's some ancient traditions that still were carried on uh, about 50 years ago, where young boys carried flaming torches through one of these cuts from um, the necropolis, the burial place, through the cut, um, at the equinox, by the way. Uh, and then they processed up to the town, lit a fire, uh, and then all celebrated. So this is kind of a, an, a very, very ancient ceremony that... Um, it's probably an echo of, of, of what it was really about. It was, it was about honoring the dead. But again, it didn't make sense to me why to go all the trouble of cutting all this rock. Here's another. Some of them actually had tombs cut into them. Inside some of these tombs, I've seen Christian crosses, and the double cross, the Lorraine cross. So they were hermitages as well. Some say the Knights Templar came here too. because The church is called Knights Templar Church nearby, so who knows. But just to show you a little bit of the height of these things, you can see, as I put the camera up, how high they go. If you can't show it in a photograph, it's just incredible. You can see these are all carved marks for, from the mason cutting the stone. And this is where the water has eroded it in the past couple of thousand years. Incredibly old. Now this is another cut, uh, but this time it's in England. It's at Ludd Church. Um, this gave me a clue as to what the cuts were used for, because at Ludd Church it's said that the stones here are highly paramagnetic, and that by walking through it and doing ceremony through it like a wedding, that's why it's called Ludd Church, um, it somehow increases your aura and uh, psychic abilities, and it's, it creates um, power around you. And that's what I experienced going through the cuts, walking through them. I could feel that my energy field was expanding. And this we doused afterwards, and it expanded several feet. So the cuts in somehow heightened your awareness from either processing from the land of the dead living at the Acropolis to the dead or vice versa. I'm not sure. But Ludd Church is a kind of British cut. Well, scouring the country, I came across another cut that has a similar story to it. Here at Arnside, near the Lake District in Cumbria, 
is um, the fairy steps, it's called. Um, now, they used to pass coffins through this route. Why? I don't know, because you can hardly squeeze through yourself. But apparently, the ch from the church to the graveyard, they had to go on this path for about five miles to get through this cut um, with this coffin. And, uh, you know, it was imperative the dead had to be passed, the body had to be passed through this rock, which I discovered was highly paramagnetic. Interestingly, we found lots of connections between the Etruscans and the, the, the Northumbrians. Um, at first, it began a bit bizarre, and people would laugh and say, oh, you, you must be joking. Because I'd say, thing, what about you know, the mountain, mountain chain that runs through Italy that um, has a, most of these polygonal cities? It's called the Apennines. And the mountain chain through um, what, what was called in ancient times um, Umbria, it's called the Pennines, because now we have North Umbria. And, of course, the Apennines in Italy is part of Umbria. And I thought, well, it's, it's, maybe it's just a coincidence, but, you know, Cumbria um, is, contains the word Umbria, but then somebody said, oh, no, it used to be Westmoreland. I said, yeah, before that it was Cumberland. You know, so these words stay around in our language and uh, give us a clue to um, the ancient people who lived there. Uh, the other thing I found quite bizarre was that at the foot of the Apennines in Italy, we had the, the, the Palace of the Kings of the Tarquins. And the Tarquins was a, um, a title rather like Arthur and uh, Prince um, Pendragon. Um, but the Tarquin kings were all powerful. Well, at the foot of the Pennines is Manchester. And Manchester has this bizarre legend that it was founded by a Tarquin king, um, which is quite bizarre. It was just sort of, it's just, it's there. And then the other district of the Umbrians was Cumbria, which is like the western Umbria. And they had a king too, who lived in a cave. And he was called Tarquin. Well, I thought that was interesting because this Tarquin was buried in a cave and all the Tarquins in, in Tuscany were buried in caves too. So, um, and then I realized that, who were these people? Well, they were supposed to be the Angles, you know. And the Angles had this runic script that's slightly different to the others, and more like Etruscan, as we found. So it's possible a colony of Etruscans may have settled, you know, in, in Umbria, because the Angles at one stage um, virtually um, took over most of the north of England. In fact, their territory spanned as far as Staffordshire. And in Staffordshire, we've got Ludchurch. So it's just an interesting sideline of mine. But here we are back on the Pelaski. The, um, their town's in red, their cities, and the Etruscans in black. And you can see there are different areas. Now, the Etruscans and the Pelaski had different centers of power. But centers uh, were very important to the Celts. They, just, they had to measure their, their kingdom, find its center, and there build their political religious center. And the center of Italy, I found, was Amelia. Um, here's another example of Etruscan walls and Roman walls. And here's an example of Pelasgian walls. This is Amelia, the geographical center of Italy. And at this point, there is a massive polygonal city walls here, two layers of them, perfectly fitted stones, um, made of um, paramagnetic limestone, which has lots of fossils in it. You can see the Roman walls above the Etruscan or Pelasgian walls, so they say. But what's interesting, if this the shape of this city is rather like a, a, a horn, but um, its center is a tower. So at the center of Italy, we have this town. At the center of this town, we have a tower. And the tower is ten-sided. And we spent some time around this tower, sort of, because we knew that the Celts were fascinated with centers, and that the centers were places of power that can have be used to affect their, their territory. 
And while we were there, a priest came in, took us into the church, and wanted to show us something desperately, and, and showed us this particular point um, on the floor. And he said, you know, stand here. So we both stood on this point, and we were both received almost like, was like incredible feeling of, of, uh, of tingling sensation, almost electricity. And when we doused afterwards, he took us to a main energy point at the center of Italy. Um, how this priest knew, I don't know. Maybe he just guessed. <laughs> but that was quite an experience. Was it near the center of the tower? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, inside the tower are all kinds of relics of the past, some Celtic knotwork from um, some earlier period. Um, and this trinity of goddesses, which I thought was fascinating. From there, we went down to Santa Severa, which is supposed to be a port of the Pulaski. Um, and that some of this port was still there to be seen, but half sunken. Oh, this would be interesting. So we arrived at Santa Severa, and of course, the guidebooks say that this castle was built on Roman foundations, but the Etruscan site is, you know, half a mile over this way. Um, and it turned out that the, uh, the site that was half a mile away was closed, so we couldn't see it. But in the museum, it turned out to be um, not a very interesting site, a late Etruscan town. That was it. So disappointingly, we walked around the castle, and um, we saw these incredible polygonal walls um, in the foundations of them. And from a map, I, um, I found out that's how the shape of the, um, the old city was, the polygonal walls and the harbor reclaimed by the sea. Yeah, Virgil describes Pygri as ancient in the days of Aeneas. And Aeneas dates from the time of 1200 BC. Um, Canina cites Dionysus in his opinion that the temple was founded by the Palastia at least two generations before the Trojan War. So that makes it about 1300 BC or something like that. <coughs> and there we see parts of the polygonal wall just, just uh, sticking out the sea. And this wonderful caption on the walls I had to photograph. just says it all, really. Palestrina was another site of one of the largest temples in Italy. It's now completely destroyed, but it's been reconstructed um, in a museum. Um, Palestrina is a town just south of Rome in the mountains. Um, it's where all the generals and uh, the Roman um, sort of leaders used to go for their summer holidays retreat. But here we found the most magnificent temple um, that had polygonal walls. And their walls went from the temple all the way up a mountain um, to a citadel at the top um, for probably about nine or ten miles of these walls. Uh, the Romans had fortified over the top, and as you can see, the smaller stones. But just, just to build these walls uh, in, in such a precarious place is just a, a feat of mind-boggling engineering. And in Palestrina, there's actually walls in some of the shops and cafes. And in the restaurant we went to, it was great. So I could have a glass of wine and look at a polygonal wall. <laughs> they remind, you know, they, they, look, they are very similar to Peruvian walls. Um, a lot of people ask me how these walls were made because it's almost impossible masonry because each one's a different shape, different size. Um, when they were made, they were all butted perfectly. There wasn't a gap. It's only weathering that's opened up the gaps you see here. Now, if you used a laser, like some people said, it would actually cause the limestone to crack and burn um, and shatter at the point of impact. So lasers, it was definitely not. Um, cutting tools, well, again, some of these stones don't show any signs of, of actual cutting, chisel, chiseling cutting tools, as if they've been cut by something smooth. But what, we don't know. Mazar? 
would that not cause a heat? Anything that would cause a heat would disturb the stone. Mm. There you are, then. They have a, th have a theory there. Um, Alatri is one of my favorite polygonal sites. It's uh, a small village in the mountains south of Palestrina, heading towards Naples. The polygonal walls here were absolutely massive, and they have something, there's something unique about this town as well. It, um, its walls have this unusual shape, and the citadel at the top is also has polygonal walls, so it's a polygonal city within a polygonal city. showing massive stones. This lintel here, above this doorway, um, is almost the length of this room. And some of the blocks inside reminded me of the blocks seen in Egypt and Greece. And there's a few others. Here's an example of how the Romans here um, built a replica of the wall in smaller stones in front of the church. Um, and you see how much weathered they are. Well, these were actually smooth at one time. But look at the polygonal walls behind, uh, which were made of a harder travertine limestone, which is almost like marble. So the, uh, the earlier limestone, the, the Roman walls are made from traditional limestone, which wore very quickly. But the Palastians built with a much harder carboniferous, if you like, limestone. Over 30 feet high, these polygonal walls, and some of the biggest stones are in the upper courses. <laughs> it's as if, you know, they, they were really showing off. It was very simple to them. Norba is one of my favorite places, because here we have a polygonal round tower. So. Not only had they placed these stones together perfectly, but they cut the outer faces to make a round tower. So, and this again was, was um, highly, highly durable travertine limestone, the kind of limestone you have in your kitchen floors. So it's very hard and very hard weathering. Norma, or Norba, is again just south of Alatri on the way to Naples. Um, apart from having this round polygonal tower, it has smaller polygonal ta uh, li little town walls. And some of the actual houses have little polygonal walls as well. But it's only recently been excavated, this site. And for some reason, it seems to have been abandoned. And again, there's no signposts or information about this place. We only found it through asking people and researching really old books on these sites written in the Victorian times. There's nothing in the Lonely Planet, put it that way. Uh, Kuma was supposed to be a site that the, that the, uh, the Palastians, they built an oracle there. And it's, it reminded me of, um, of some of the, the oracles in Greece. Uh, again, this is all carved out of solid rock. Um, and there are side chambers through here. And at the very back would be um, the oracle itself who would speak through a hole in the wall. But the sound that comes out of these chambers is the key because they're shaped um, for resonance. And it reminded me of, of one of the... Um, the rooms inside Tiryns in Greece, which date from 3000 BC. This shape has, um, seemed to be quite important to them in their buildings. Paestum, um, the last site we are visiting in Italy, um, was built, according to legend, by the Pelasgians. And it's one of the last buildings they built. And what an incredible building this is. It's like stepping into Atlantis. Has anybody heard of this place before? You've been there? What an incredible site. Isn't it? The foundations uh, of one of the temples left is fascinating because um, it shows the same sort of a similar sort of architecture to the Osirum in Egypt. And, and the same mortises, tent joints, and dovetailing you see at Stonehenge. 
So the masons who built these Pelasgic masons were highly advanced people and probably built many of the monuments around Europe. Um, in Greece, we decided to continue with the oracles and go to the Nacramentium, which is supposed to be where the river Styx is, that where the boat, boatmen would take the souls of the dead into the underworld. This is the actual river, the Archon, that's supposed to be the river Styx. It's a magical place. Again, it's a tradition to walk through this valley barefoot in the river, and the walls get narrower and narrower, and you can feel the power of the stone as you get, you know, it's a bit like the cuts again. It's this connecting with the power of stone. At the Nacramento, you see some of the finest polygonal masonry um, throughout this whole sanctuary. But underground, there is a rock-cut chamber um, where people communicate with the dead. It was said that if, you want, if you'd lost, an, lost a relative, you would um, concentrate on this relative, go into this chamber, meditate on your own, and call upon the spirit. So we thought we'd do this. Um, so, but we thought we'd call upon Athena because we were following Michael and the, the uh, Apollo Athena lines, uh, the Earth energy grids, uh, lines that come from Ireland through Britain, uh, through the Nacramentia, the, uh, there was the female Athena current, so we, we meditated on Athena. And this is what came up on the photograph. One of those orbs again. But this one is quite bright, and Caroline couldn't see it, but she looks as though she's looking at it. But this chamber is very unusual. It's carved out of solid rock with these... Um, it obviously collapsed at one time. They'd had to, they had to put these... Um, stone arches in. The floor is, is seriously worn and <laughs> it, it feels like it's thousands of years old, this site. But again, we felt that the spirits of the dead were all around us in this place and it sort of came out on film as well because there's more than one orb there. There's actually hundreds if I turn the brightness up. And Delphi, the, uh, as following the oracles and the Pelasgi, the Pelasgi were like, fascinated with the, with the, uh, the other world and Delphi was also supposed to be a Pelasgian site. And, again, an omphalus of, of the world, a center, again. Uh, so here we are at um, Delphi. You can see the fantastic polygonal walls here. Now, we, we did some research and found that these walls are the oldest at Delphi. But um, there are all periods of Greek architecture in this site as well as the polygonal walls. So I think it made sense to us that the Pelasgian walls were the polygonal walls. Of course, the, the Pelasgians also spread into Turkey. And here we have the ancient walls at Assos, um, which is not, far, not that far from um, Troy. And on Crete, there's, there's only one site on Crete that has Pelasgian walls, and that's the polygonal walls of Axos which is high in the mountains above Harnia. Now this site had been hit by something incredibly strong, like a, a, a tsunami, a tornado or something, it, because the walls on the other side of this town had completely disappeared and all been thrown this way, as if something from the direction of Santorini had um, completely wiped the walls away and jumbled all these fantastic polygonal walls up. So. That could date these polygonal walls back to 1500 BC, when Thera, or Santorini, blew. So the Pelasgians may date from this time, or earlier. And inside there is this um, tablet with ancient form of Greek writing on it, which they haven't properly deciphered. It's one of the earliest um, tablets of Greek writing. It's almost like proto-Phoenician script. This may be Pelasgian script. Now, the Mycenae um, is another site that we went to visit because there are polygonal walls here. But in some parts of Mycenae, the walls feel even older than the polygonal walls seen in Italy. On one part of um, the massive walls of Mycenae, there has been a breach where 
the late the the, um, the older walls were replaced by later Iron Age polygonal walls. And just around the corner here, the old walls begin again. And I, I just wondered what kind of force would blow down a 30-foot wall uh, in order for it to be repaired. And, and I kept thinking, why are these walls, what were they building these walls for anyway? Uh, what kind of enemy did they have that required 40-foot walls of massive stones? Well, one thing we do know is polygonal walls are earthquake-proof. When we have an earthquake in all the earthquake zones of Italy, these walls just ripple with the earthquake. But straight, straight squared block courses shatter and crack and explode and break and fall. But polygonal walls ripple with the rhythm of the earth and even tighten up. They're the perfect walls, in the most indestructible walls. So somebody, um, some civilization, maybe the Pulaski, maybe some other, um, were able to build these fantastic walls. How they did it, we still don't know. Another theory is water pressure, because some of the most intricate jewelry is made from high-pressure water. You're cutting metals, and it's possible they could have cut uh, a rock face. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, is you get a rock face, you, you have to um, cut each piece in a jigsaw-like fashion, and then cut down the middle so they all fall out, and then rebuild that wall as a polygonal wall. That's the only way they could do it. But what they used to cut through is, is the thing. It has to be something either high-pressured or um, Mazar or whatever. It's the only theory I've got. Um, that was the, um, this is the treasury of Treas. That was the site you just seen of um, where they found the Trojan gold, so they say, the gold of Troy. Um, the Treasury of Treves is probably the most m incredible megalithic monument in Europe to me. Uh, it contains some of the largest stones in the world, apart from Peru, of course, and, um, and Baalbek. But for those of you who do go to Greece and you want to go visit um, something magnificent, uh, go to Mycenae and you'll see the Treasury of Treves. Mycenae is in the Peloponnese part of Greece. So you see some of the size of the stones here are, are fantastic. These are not polygonal, but still, they were able to move large stones. This lintel up here is one of the biggest I've ever seen. But inside, there's this fantastic corbel ceiling. And the sound in here was critical, because when you make a sound in, in the very center, it has a, a two-second delay, which I thought was fantastic. So it was obviously built for sound or resonance, rather like the pyramids. Another of the megalithic sites in Greece we came across was, um, was a pyramid. Um, not known in the guidebooks, it's called the Menelaean Pyramid, just above Sparta. Um, it's dedicated to, um, to Helen and Menelaus. Unfortunately, it's collapsed and destroyed now, but uh, you can see the base and the inner tower of this pyramid. And the Hellenic Pyramid on the Peloponnese is also worth seeing. Not many people know there are pyramids in it in Greece. See polygonal type masonry. It's not the largest pyramid in the world, but there is internal chambers. And this unusual arched doorway, which I've seen in buildings in Ireland and in Italy. But inside, there's a, there's a hole like, um, that, that goes out to the outside from inside this chamber. So there was either a ventilation hole, and if it was a f place for the dead, then it wouldn't have a vent. So it was obviously a place of ceremony. Other pyramids, like the Ligurian nearby, have disappeared long ago. Only the foundations left. Farmers were actually helping themselves to these pyramids, the stones on the pyramid, uh, up until the last 50 years. Uh, such is the regard the Greeks have for their historical sites. Um, I think Oneidae is probably the, the best polygonal wall city in the world. Um, probably better than ones in, in Peru. And I'll say that because I've been there and seen it for myself and walked around. 
its walls, which spread over seven miles. Oinidae is on the mainland Greece, um, not too far, bet well, actually, between Delphi and Parparga. Yeah. But again, there's no signpost to it. There's nothing in the guidebooks. The whole only planet is no good if you want to find these sites. You've got to um, research um, old books, old guidebooks from the 50s backwards who mention some of these sites. Um, We'd heard about Oneidae being one of the most impressive polygonal cities. When we arrived there, after a long, arduous um, three hours of, of in and out of streets and up and down, uh, we actually found it. And um, it was surrounded by a 30-foot high wall um, of metal fencing put up by the EEC. And they said that... that that they were protecting the site from vandalism. But there's big signs all over saying, no photographs, no photographs. Yeah, no photographs allowed. And I thought, it's an historical site. Why can't we photograph it? So, I mean, I'm all right to take photographs of the outside, the wall here, but on the inside, there was something that they didn't want us to see. And I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you what it was in a minute. These are the walls, over seven miles of them. This was actually, a, we found out when we got closer, it was an actual port. Um, this was a dry dock harbour. The sea, now two miles away, used to come all the way up to this site. And this was a dry dock where they kept their long boats. And these were devices where they could lift the boats up and down from this centre here. So it was like a, a boat repair shop. It was one of the dry docks. Uh, these, these docks are cut out of solid rock. Uh, there's no stone upon stone uh, um, in this part. They were all cut out of solid rock. There's only stone upon stone in the in-between um, bays. In the center of the city, there's a red tower, um, which has classic sort of Greek masonry, but it's tied in with polygonal walls, as if at one time this tower collapsed in some great earthquake and the Greeks came along and rebuilt their own version. They could no longer build in the style of the Cyclopean, uh, sorry, polygonal, but they could. So it's an interesting example of how they, they've knitted the later masonry in with the polygonal masonry. Now what blew me away was this amphitheater, massive amphitheater. It was heavily eroded it's carved out of solid rock. They've just carved it into the mountain. All these um, seats are carved out of, sculpted out of the rock. And you see they've replaced stones where, where, the, where they've been worn out. And some of the wearing along here looks like there's been water flowing down here for hundreds of probably thousands of years. They've just worn away the stone, the stairs completely. And we found a polygonal arch um, the first I've ever seen. Because I was always told the Romans, the Etruscans, invented the arch. And, and that was just a straight arch. And here we had a curved arch made of polygonal stones. Fantastic. So after seeing those sites in Italy, we decided to go over to Italy uh, to, to Egypt to see if there's any polygonal walls in, in that country and see if the Pelasgians were there. Because there's a rumor that the Pelasgians actually had their own sort of colony in Egypt. Well, we, we headed for the Osirian because to me the Osirian is probably one of the most mysterious megalithic sites uh, in Egypt. Um, it's built of massive granite blocks that are cut and smoothed which today would be um, a real feat in any mason's shop. And here's just a, a little view of it. You see how they've they placed the stones here, just like the ones at Stonehenge with a noddle on top and a cup. Here again you see it. In fact, some people say to me, there's no sign of any other masonry like Stonehenge out of side of England. Well, here we are. This is very much like built in the same way as Stonehenge. 
But accordingly, the, the guidebooks say this site dates, you know, from the time of Seti the first. Um, but clearly, this type of masonry is is much older. Yes, it reminded me of the masonry at Paston, as I mentioned before. I managed to get down very close to the water at the asylum. It's supposed to be the legendary birthplace of Osiris. Now you see how the water level is at the bottom there. The archaeologists cannot get to the bottom of this structure because it just keeps flooding. At some time in the past thousand years or two thousand years, the water level has risen in this area so that they cannot excavate what's at the bottom of this structure. It's believed just to be a temple complex. But um, the other mysterious thing about it is the um, seed of life, which, which I, I asked a few people about this, because I thought, well, is it sketched? Is it carved? No, it's actually burnt into the granite. Um, which I found was incredible. How did they do that? Granite is, um, is, one, of the is hard, one of the hardest substances and most paramagnetic substances in the world. Uh, so how did they etch this wonderful two, actually two wonderful flowers of life, if you like, or seed of life, as uh, John Varlow calls it, and burn it into the granite? And of course, a lot of this was buried or underwater at one time, but it survived intact. But I was lucky to get down there. Of course, you've got to bribe a few guards and everything in, in Egypt. You can't do anything without money in Egypt. But hashish. Yeah. The Ramesseum, to me, I've got to show you this because um, I'm fascinating with megalithic engineering. And the Ramesseum is one of those sites a lot of people don't visit often. They tend to take the bus right past and um, they go to other sites. But this is in the... Um, the, the left bank uh, near the Valley of the Kings. Um, just past the statues of Menmen, you go up the road, take a right towards the Valley of the Kings. Well, the Ramesseum is on your left, sorry, on your right. And it's supposed to be the, a temple, mortuary temple of Ramesses, the first, or, or was it the second? I can't remember. But anyway, there's a statue there that had fallen in a great earthquake. Um, they said it was around 1850, this earthquake appeared. But it is made out of one piece, one piece of Aswan granite. Um, legs, you can't see the legs at the moment, they're on this platform. But, um, this is the, uh, the midriff area, uh, the chest and shoulders, and the head. Now, okay, I can, I can accept that it's, you know, they, they could have carved this in sight, but how did they move a block of stone that big. Uh, some say it was never moved, it was a natural piece of granite, but we actually studied it and looked underneath, there was limestone underneath. So um, they've definitely brought to the area. So how did they move such a massive piece of granite? I think I have a little shot of just how big it is. This is the base here. Its feet were down here. And you can see its feet here, look. <laughs> and that's, I was taking the film from over here. I don't know why that, that is not one of the um, wonders of Egypt. It seems to have been missed. But I thought I'd bring that into this talk because I think it deserves to be shown and visited. So looking for polygonal masonry, we didn't find. We did find classic um, Greek masonry in Italy and in Egypt at Dendera, the Temple of Horus, or Temple of Hathor. Um, and it seems the whole building was built in the same style as the the ancient Greeks. So the Greeks did come to Egypt, but not the palastri. We hadn't seen any sign of polygonal walls, but they're still beautifully knitted. 
and it's very different. The, the, the Egyptian way of building and masonry is very different to the Greek. The Greek almost used this Cyclopean way of building. Um, straight, rough, roughly straight courses, but still, you know, cutting out is still very impressive. So Dendera is actually a Greek um, monument. It's only at the Sphinx Temple we started to see something more like the Pelasgian type walls. And the Valley Temple contains some of the largest stones I've seen in Egypt. But inside the temple are these wonderful granite um, walls. Cut almost in the polygonal style, not quite though. These, again, they are they're, they're laid in courses almost, but um, they're not in the, the, the different sort of shapes as they are in the Greek ones. But still, these walls feel ancient and old, but I didn't feel they were Pelasgian. They are much older. At Saqqara, there's again there's a different civilization that had taken over this site because the buildings <coughs> were very different from all the other Greek, uh, from all the other Egyptian buildings we've seen, and they almost look Mesopotamian in their style, in their architecture and style. But no sign of the Pelasgians in Egypt, we were interested to find. But we have followed the trail to Romania now because we found polygonal walls and cities in the mountains of Romania. So it's taken us not you know, in, in the direction we thought. It's there's no sign of polygonal walls in the Mesopotamian areas. <coughs> in fact, they seem to be spreading out into northern Europe um, and towards the Black Sea. So. Um, this is part of an ongoing quest that, um, that, that we're, d we're doing in our spare time. But, uh, somebody once asked me, are there any signs of megalithic structures in England besides stone circles and long barrows? And I did find one eventually, uh, this, this megalithic bridge on Exmoor called the Tar Steps. It's truly megalithic. They use massive stones. And according to the uh, guidebooks, it dates you know, back to uh, the, the Stone Age. So there are megalithic structures in Britain, apart from, um, and in Ireland we have, you know, the, the ancient oratories that use a similar style of masonry to the Greeks, these type of doorways we've seen. And the megalithic round towers, yes, I mean, some people say they date from the 11th, 12th centuries, but um, some of the oldest ones have masonry at the bottom that is almost polygonal. They are placed together with no mortar, stone upon stone, in the Cyclopean way. Um, but most of them, it's only in the lower courses, and then you see Saxon or Norman stonework above it. And I found through the, um, the Irish annals that most of these round towers fell in an earthquake in the 4th century AD, 75 in fact. Um, so a lot of these round towers are actually repaired after that time. But the original round towers, and this is the only one left at Kilmukdo that has um, the original masonry, is truly Cyclopean. And it has these wonderful pointed arch windows that are seen in Greece and in Italy. So maybe the Pulaski came and built some of these towers, or was it the two of the who came from Greece? We don't know. Here are some of the walls of Messina that are very similar to the Irish round towers. Okay, this is the end of our journey, and um, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>